Hey everyone. Um, if you don't mind if I move the podium a little back because I feel like it's enough to cover like 10 cases here. I want to see you guys. Okay. That's better. Okay, so as was just explained, you guys have had a talk on God the Father, right? Then you had a talk on God the Son, right? So now, who do we get to talk about? That's right, we get to talk about Gabe. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the Holy Spirit. Has there ever been something in your life that is really important, but you forget to think about it? Take oxygen, for example. How many times a day do you think about oxygen? Zero. How many times a day do you use oxygen? Quite a lot, right? A billion is a good guess. Okay. Or take that annoying younger brother. You try very hard to forget his existence, you know, till he has a stick of gum. Then all of a sudden he enters back into existence in your world and he holds some kind of importance, right? Because you have a selfish interest in him. But other than that, as important as he is, you don't think about him very much. Right? So I think we all relate to this idea. And this, unfortunately, is what the Holy Spirit suffers a lot. In that we can think a lot about God the Father. As the first talk mentioned, the entire Mass is addressed to God the Father. We think a lot about God the Son. Jesus Christ was human, just like all of us. He died to save us. The Holy Spirit is kind of like oxygen. And he just stays in the background a little too much. So, confirmation is a wonderful sacrament where you can remember exactly who he is and how important he is. So before going any further, I want to share a personal story of when I absolutely, totally, and utterly forgot the power of the Holy Spirit. It was a long time ago when I was in high school, still wearing diapers like some of you, and I was thinking about doing what I'm doing now, becoming a consecrated woman in regular Christie. So it was in the back of my mind, I was wondering about it, okay, you know, what if God wants that for me? I'm not sure. So I was in conversation with a consecrated woman who was very wise and I had known her for a while, and so I trusted her, and I was sharing with her my thoughts on the matter. So I said, you know, thinking about doing this whole, like, consecrated life thing, you know, joining your community, becoming you know, this kind of vocation, um, but she looks at me and she's like, yes, what? Like, well, <laughs> I don't feel like I would fit in. She's like, really? I'm like, no. Like, because you see, you're consecrated, right? She's like, yeah, I'm consecrated. I'm like, okay. Um, you're really, like, holy. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> like, I mean, I know, um, I know I go to Mass and all these nice things, but I was like, but I also have friends, you know, and I mean, they're not, like, the greatest of friends. It's not like we hang out and decide to play freeze tag together. No, we do other things, and, um, I don't think I want you to ever hear the music that I'm listening to, and just all these things started coming to mind of what I've done in my life, the bad habits I had, the sins I've committed, and I just didn't click with becoming a consecrated woman, right? Do you see the issue in my heart at the moment? And this consecrated woman who knew me very well and who trusted me paused for a moment after I said that. And then she looked at the ground. She said a little prayer to the Holy Spirit. And then she looked back up into my eyes. And she said, Monique, don't you dare tell God what he can and can't do in your life. Don't you dare. And I was like, well, if that's the case, where do I stop? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't you dare tell God what he can and can't do in your life. She was recognizing in my heart and my soul 
that I had lost faith in the power of the Holy Spirit to change me. I had stopped believing that I could become a better person, that my life could be transformed to the point of following a religious vocation like this. I forgot what the Holy Spirit can do, just like we forget what oxygen does. And I'm not the only person in the history of humanity to forget that. We all know there were 12 apostles, these 12 men who followed Jesus Christ. They spent three entire years, okay, working next to him, like side by side, like, hey, all chummy. You know, they had secret handshakes and stuff. And Jesus performed miracles in front of them. You know, he's walking on water, you know, one day. The next day, he's like floating in the sky with Moses and Elijah. The next day, you know, these demons were all flying out of people. I mean, there's some incredible stuff they saw, right? And three years of that are ended by a brutal passion and death of this Jesus, followed by, all of a sudden, he shows up again, you know, walking around among them, you know, the wounds, and he's eating and walking, they're like, oh my gosh. The next thing they see, he's like ascending into heaven, surrounded by angels and singing choirs, you know, and the clouds are parting, and he's seated at the right hand of God, and they're like, oh my gosh. And then, guess where they go? They go to an upper room and lock the doors and hide in there for 50 days. They were scared, they felt alone, they felt abandoned, they felt confused, they were afraid. They were afraid because they forgot that the Holy Spirit was coming. They forgot what the Holy Spirit can do. And when the Holy Spirit comes, what was that day called? We call it, it starts with a P, what do we call that day? Pentecost. Penta for the 50 days, five. Pentecost was when the Holy Spirit came. Did the Holy Spirit change them? Oh yeah, you wouldn't be here if it didn't change them. They would have all died in that upper room, that would have been the end of the church, right? But no, Pentecost was the birthday of the church, when the Holy Spirit came down in flaming tongues of fire on each one of them, and they had to basically kick the door down, run out to the crowds that were outside, preach Jesus' name, and baptize 3,000 people on the spot. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. That is what confirmation is all about. Your confirmation is your Pentecost. It is your time to open your heart to receive that same fire that the apostles did 2,000 years ago. That same fire to change your lives, change your hearts. And don't you dare start telling God what he can and can't do in your life. Like Gabe said at the beginning, God will only come into your hearts if you open the door. How many of us in this room right now feel afraid, feel alone, feel confused, feel like we're locked in a dark room? Then what better time for Pentecost than now? What better time for confirmation than now? After y'all are confirmed, you guys out there should be able to walk into a room and people would look at you and think to themselves or say to their friends, that guy right there, he's not just about going to church on Sundays. That guy is a courageous Catholic through and through. That guy doesn't just pretend he believes. 
He is on fire with the Holy Spirit. And you girls out there, when you walk into a room after your confirmation, everyone in the room should turn and point at you and say, This girl is on fire! <laughs> that was for all you sleeping out there. <laughs> Pray to him, and he will fulfill his promise. Pray to him with faith, and he will fulfill his promise. I was debating whether or not to say something Carrie wanted me to say. But I guess I'll say it. Out of friendship and devotion to you, Carrie, I'll mention it. But I really didn't want to. So I think it's super cheesy. She's like, okay, so you know it was just Valentine's Day. I'm like, oh, here we go again. Like, and you're wearing pink. I'm like, shoot me now. She's like, you should go up there and say, the Holy Spirit is just like Cupid. I was like, the naked guy with the bow and arrow? <laughs> he's like, yeah. He's like Cupid. He like flies around and like shoots us with arrows of love. <laughs> I was like, that's gonna be so inspiring for these kids, you know? Confirmation day. They're gonna go up and like when the bitch is about to give their blessing and say, like, oh, what's your saint name? I'll probably say Cupid. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Who gave the Holy Spirit talk at your confirmation retreat? But <laughs> I mean, the idea behind that is whenever you have an inspiration, you know, you see someone who's by his or herself in a corner sobbing, do you pretend not to notice them and just walk away? Hopefully not. Hopefully you're shot with a cupid arrow and you think, hey, this person needs some TLC. I'm on it. You know, and you walk over and do something about the tears or at least hand them a tissue. So, in order to build this relationship with the Holy Spirit, like Abe was talking about at the beginning, you need to accept Cupid's arrows, okay? You need to embrace them. Let them pierce your heart. This is getting cheesier by the minute. <laughs> you need to remember that those thoughts don't come from you. Those thoughts of, okay, I'm going to reach out and help this person, or I'm going to say something nice to her, or I'm going to, I don't know, wash the dishes without my parents knowing or I'm going to walk the dog without being asked, or anything like that, those don't come from you, they come from the Holy Spirit. So to recognize Him in your heart when you see that, and thank Him. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for that inspiration. Every day you go to school, begin the day praying to the Holy Spirit. Make Him a part of your life. And like I said earlier, the more He becomes a part of your life, and the more you pray to Him, the better and the more fulfilling his promises will be in your life. So thank you all for trying your best to stay awake. Thank you.